introduction panel, you ask questions. <laughs> um, and then at the end, we'll break um, for some more informal networking over there. Um, I hope you get really comfortable with each other. Don't be shy. All of our panelists are here because they're also very passionate about increasing diversity in aerospace and want to see you all succeed as well. So, any questions before we get started? You excited? Yeah, I don't believe you. Are you excited? Yeah. Much better, cool. Awesome, so hopefully all the technical kinks are out of the way and hopefully my PowerPoint slide will move forward. Yay, so this is not in order of what I'm gonna say. Hopefully you'll figure out who I'm talking about. So our first guest is Miguel Ayala. He is the CEO of Aphelion Aerospace joining us today. Next, we have Vanessa Clark. She is the Chief Executive Officer or CEO at Atomo Space. We also have Sierra Gonzalez. I tried to find a Lockheed Martin <laughs> picture to put at the bottom, but I couldn't find it. She's a software systems engineer and test engineer at Lockheed Martin Space. Then we have Casey Coons, who's a senior system engineer at Ursa Major Technologies. Summer Sayedi, who is a manufacturing engineer at Ball Aerospace. And then Amanda Steckel, who is a National Science Foundation graduate research fellow at the University of Colorado at Boulder. So let me stop sharing my screen so we can have our panelists big and happy on the screen. Somehow, I guess that's good enough. <laughs> Awesome. So I'm actually, if, if my video is working properly, I'm actually going to come down there. So I'm not feeling weird and awkward up here all by myself. Once I figure out what it is I'm doing. Okay, cool. Okay. And if you're ever feeling uncomfortable or awkward, you can trust me to be more awkward and make you feel more comfortable. So it'll be great. Okay. All right, so to get us started, I just want us to go down the line and introduce yourself, tell us a bit more about your background, where you went to school, what you majored in, and how you got to where you are now. I think this part is really insightful, so don't feel rushed to answer this question. We have plenty of time, so tell us all about yourself, all the important points we want to know all about you. We'll start with Amanda. All right, um, can you guys... Also panelists, you probably wanna talk into the mic and you push your little button so it turns green, um, but you can leave it off until you speak. There you go, sorry. All right, so I guess I'll leave mask on. Um, so if you're sitting up here, you can take off your mask. You guys keep your mask on. Okay. I see you, thank you. <laughs> Just in case there's trouble hearing me, yeah. Um, so I'm Amanda, I'm currently a graduate student um, I'm on an NSF uh, fellowship at CU Boulder, so I'm right up the road. Um, but I got my start in aerospace actually with a mechanical engineering degree, so don't need an engineering, de uh, an aerospace degree for sure. Um, and then I did an aerospace master's, just a one-year master's. And then I uh, worked a few different places, including SpaceX, NASA, um, and I settled down sort of at a, um, a research institute called MIT Lincoln Laboratory. Um, and I was doing optomechanical de design of different satellite payloads. Um, I did that for many years and um, I realized that I wanted to start to design my own payloads. And to do that, you kind of need to know a little bit more about the science of what are we up there to study? What are we up there to look at? So I've made a big pivot and I went and decided to go back to graduate school. So I'm in a PhD program now to do exactly that. And I'm studying life on Mars, life on Europa. <laughs> How do we answer some of these big science questions? Um, so um, I, I have a pretty diverse background. <laughs> and I'm also working part-time at a, um, um, a startup um, in this local area with um, using my mechanical engineering skills. So mechanical engineering is very valuable. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Amanda. Miguel. Oh, the button. <laughs> So my name is Miguel Ayala, uh, and I've been in the aerospace industry for about 20 years. Um, when I was in college, I, um, I mean, at some point, maybe I'll tell you a story before college, otherwise it would be like a book or something. So, <laughs> so, so I was in college, I started uh, uh, with majoring in electrical engineering for the first year. And after a couple of courses, I decided that that wasn't my thing. 
So then I pursued mechanical engineering and because in the, in the end, I wanted to be in the aerospace industry. I wanted to build rockets and I wasn't sure what part to, uh, to focus on. So then I, um, I continued going to school and pursuing mechanical engineering. And um, um, I got some internships at um, the different companies like um, now called Northrop Grumman and um, you know, worked on rockets. And, um, and then eventually I, decided that um, I wanted to, I wanted to learn so much about building rockets that I pursued a second degree uh, in the aerospace engineering and the first one was more focused on uh, fluids fluid systems propulsion the second one was more focused on structures like aerospace structures composites and things like that and then I wanted to work at uh, Honeywell on uh, on the um, on the International Space Station the um, the F35 fighter jets um, the space shuttle, things like that. And then eventually I uh, spent some time at uh, SpaceX, worked on the Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy, Dragon. Um, uh, at SpaceX, I was mainly working on the ground systems. So then I made a move to Colorado uh, because uh, the mountains here remind me of uh, my, my, my hometown. I was actually born in a small village in the Andes Mountains in South America. So I, I want to be here, you know, in, in the mountains. I'm a mountain man. <laughs> so... So I came here and I worked on the Orion um, program um, at Lockheed, and then I um, joined a, 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 a like an engineering services company where I was uh, I finished as a senior program manager managing. Uh, I, I stood up the, the the Denver office basically of that company uh, focused on space systems, and after that I thought you know what I think it's time to go solo. So I started I started a, um, I joined a startup a, a few years ago. And um, fortunately, uh, we had, um, it was too big of a dream. <laughs> it was too huge uh, uh, of a project and uh, the pandemic pretty much killed it. <laughs> okay, it put it a hold. <laughs> so then uh, I, as, as, you know, as, as I was dealing through the pandemic, with the pandemic, I was doing my consulting, uh, or I was working on consulting. I, start, I, I was running my consulting company and that's how I, uh, joined uh, Fueling Aerospace, uh, initially called Phoenix Launch Systems, and I am now the CEO of uh, Fueling Aerospace, and we're developing um, green, low-cost, on-demand, design-build launch services for nanosatellites. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Miguel. Summer, let's hear from you. <laughs> um, I'm generally pretty loud, so actually talking at this tone through the mic is very weird for me. So if I start to get really loud, I apologize right now. <laughs> um, thank you for having me. My name is Summer Saidi. Um, so far, my career is not as diver diverse. I'm still kind of trying to figure out like long-term what I like to, what I want to do in um, engineering and aerospace. But to give you a little background, um, I graduated uh, in 2016 from the University of Central Oklahoma in uh, engineering physics. Before I got into any kind of engineering, um, I was a theater major, go figure, um, and only because I didn't know what I wanted to do, to be quite honest. And um, for a while, I, I was in and out of college for a while. Um, and after uh, that stint, I decided that uh, being poor was not cool. Mm -hmm. um, struggling financially was not awesome. And I was very good at math and science. So uh, I decided there was an engineering program, uh, engineering physics. It was the only engineering program at my tiny school. So that's what I pursued. Uh, I found my first like real kind of engineering job was a mom and pop shop in Oklahoma city where I was the only woman that worked there. It was a, <laughs> it was um, a warehouse basically that was not climate controlled. And so they did, um, they were kind of like a subcontractor. They built um, storage for weaponry. They did um, a couple of um, contracts for, the armored Humvees, um, like different things like that. So I convinced the owner to give me an opportunity. I said, I need a job. And if you don't like me, you can just fire me. And so he liked me and I worked there for about three years um, in manufacturing. So after I graduated in 2016, um, I 
basically spent a year looking for a position, any position, especially out of Oklahoma. Uh, I uh, had a friend that was working out of uh, Tinker Air Force Base and um, a recruiter called him from Ball Aerospace. And I said, oh my God, they're so awesome. They did the optical elements for um, the Hubble Space Telescope. They're doing James Webb. Like I'm a nerd. I knew all these things that convinced him to apply. He got hired. I got very jealous. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, you know, I'm still applying, still applying. He's sending me like requisitions. And so um, some manufacturing positions came up. So I applied. They called me two weeks later and I gave them the same spiel. Like, how do I know of Ball Aerospace? Well, I only knew Ball Aerospace from the space side. And it turns out that they are involved in a lot of military contracts, primarily like communications equipment, antennas and cameras. So, um, you know, I interviewed, I did very well and here I am. Um, so I'm in manufacturing, which is actually perfect for me because you're kind of a jack of all trades. You kind of have to know a little bit about every part of the process of the equipment that you're building. And that's how I like to learn. I'm very kinetic and that's what I'm aware of. So, um, I've been there for about four years and I work with incredible people and I'm always learning, you know, I'm always learning about the electrical side. I'm learning about RF engineering, um, mechanical, and it all comes together. And so what I do every day is I basically rally the troops and we have a process and we build something and it's super cool. Um, on top of that, I'm very into, um, diversity and inclusion at Ball Aerospace And this year we made it our number five business case. So um, having Amanda invite me here on this panel to talk about, you know, my experiences, you know, being brown, being female, basically in an all white space is something that I would like to share with all of you. So thank you for having me. Wonderful. Thank you, Summer. Vanessa. Hello, everyone. My voice isn't quite that loud. So if you can't hear me, please let me know. So I'm obviously not from Colorado. Um, I grew up on a sheep ranch in the middle of nowhere in Australia. And when I was in high school, I just wanted to do whatever sounded most difficult, (laughs) particularly if people said I could not do that. So, you know, some of the things I was throwing around were like astronaut, astrophysicist, aerospace engineer, like really careers I knew nothing about, but just sounded awesome. Um, When I went to university, I actually went to a local school because I had an older boyfriend who went there. Like really bad reason to make a a career decision, but it turned out okay in the end. Being at a small school with just 10 people in the course, like I had one-on-one time with professors. I could book lab equipment for months on end and no one else wanted to use it. It was actually really phenomenal. Um, so I ended up studying physics and mathematics because they were the two things I really liked in high school. And when I graduated, I went and I worked for two weeks at a facility called ANSTO. So it's the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organization. They have a research reactor there. They do a lot of really cool nuclear experiments, but I hated it. After graduating as a physicist, I was planning to work there for maybe six months and then going back and doing a PhD, but I learned that I hated running the same experiment and I hated statistical analysis and I hated writing scientific papers. I hated it all. So I left after two weeks and I went back to school (laughs) and I did a master's in aerospace engineering, which was really interesting because I hadn't done any engineering subjects except for electrical engineering. And suddenly I was here doing graduate level mechanical engineering stuff. So I actually was told to go sit in some of the second year classes, which was humbling. I got a lot of help though, because I was the only woman. This is where things started to get difficult because being the only woman and being older, people expected me to be really good. And so every time I made a mistake, I was mobbed by teammates, by professors, by anyone. And so, you know, if you're a minority, you know that you're always under the microscope. So I ended up, let's see, not letting that get to me. And I ended up creating my own program. I wanted to study overseas. 
because in Australia, they didn't have a space industry back then, 15 years ago. I wanted to build rockets or satellites. The only space things I could do in Australia were signals intelligence. There's a couple of really large military bases in Australia that collect signals and data for allies like the US. I didn't want to do that. I was like, I don't want to work in the intelligence community. I really want to build things. So I ended up leaving my master's degree and going to Germany. Went to Germany because their university as a guest student is 200 euros per semester, full fee paying. So I could go there as a guest full fee paying student and actually save money. So I did. So I found a university that actually taught half of their courses in English. And I went there for the final six months of my master's. And then I did what they call in Europe an industry thesis. So I was at a company for six months writing my thesis. And I stayed at that company for another few months. That company was called Astrium at the time. Now they're called Ariane Group. They make the Ariane family of launch vehicles. So I got to design and build rockets for the Europeans. Australia eventually gave me my master's degree, but it took a lot of convincing because they didn't want to transfer credits. They thought I'd left, but I eventually got it. And now they have an exchange program. So it worked out. <laughs> um, I ended up staying in Germany for five years. One reason for this is not because I really loved the weather or the food. I don't eat pork or bread. So it's kind of, you know, it was tough. Um, but they have this really great program where if you have a STEM background, if you get a job offer, you automatically get a visa. So I could stay there. So I ended up working at the German Space Agency. I worked in launch vehicle design, interplanetary mission design with a heavy propulsion focus. I ended up moving to the US in 2015, really on a whim. The US has this really interesting program called the Green Card Lottery. <laughs> so even though it benefited me, I disagree with it, but it's really a lottery where they give out 50,000 green cards a year and they don't prioritize people living in the US. They don't prioritize people with family in the US. It's open to the entire world. And I actually won that when I entered the first time. I didn't know I'd moved to the US, but one day after a fight with my very German rigid boss, I was like, you know what? I still have this green card thing. I booked a flight to JFK and I landed one hour before my entry visa closed. And I've been here since. So I worked at Lockheed Martin in Colorado for three years. I worked with Miguel on the Orion program. But in 2018, I left to start my own company, Atomo Space. I can talk about that company later, but currently we're 23 employees, I think. We've raised a couple of rounds of venture capital. We've got uh, won a few million dollars in government contracts and we're sending up our first system next year. Sorry, that was very long-winded. <laughs> no, thank you. That was wonderful. Sierra, let's hear from you. Hi. Thanks for having me here. I'm Sierra Gonzalez. Um, I am from Reno, Nevada. Uh, so very similar. It's not like Vegas or close to Vegas. <laughs> so don't make that joke. I get really sad about it. Um, <laughs> uh, I, in high school, similarly was in performing arts uh, like summer. Uh, <laughs> and I thought I was gonna be a professional musician. I still play bass to this day in orchestras and stuff, um, but I don't make as much money in that. <laughs> so um, I am definitely not as professional as I used to be, but <laughs> I decided, um, well, in high school, they make you choose what you want to be for the rest of your life. And I hated that. I thought that was like a really daunting decision to make and felt that maybe engineering would be broad enough that I could still be creative and do the math and science that I love to do. Um, and so I thought, you know, I love space. I love the Rover. Let's look at robotics engineering. And at the time when I graduated high school in 2013, um, there's only 10 universities in the States that offered that kind of degree. And I could only afford to apply to one university <laughs> at the time. Um, and so I ended up staying in Nevada and got my, uh, enrolled as an undeclared engineer. Um, and the first week of orientation, they made me choose something. So for others that are also indecisive, just roll with it. Um, <laughs> And I really liked it. The first year we made hovercrafts and I was like, wow, this is awesome. I, they're little, not big. So um, I really enjoyed that. Um, still got to play my music, um, got told a lot. No, I couldn't do both, 
but I prevailed doing a minor in music and um, rolled with mechanical engineering. Um, I got a job at the engineering library working in the makerspace, and um, it was it kind of set a lot of standards for libraries across the United States to incorporate new technologies like that. So it was cool to be part of that wave um, for 3D printing and laser cutters and things like that and help customers, patrons, students make things for their classes. I really like that hands-on experience. Um, and then uh, looking for internships, which all of you will experience. I took the first one I could get and it was <laughs> my junior year and I worked for a Raylan Metro company um, and it was a company of five and I was the fifth person and I did not enjoy being uh, the fifth person in a company. It just wasn't for me. I know it's it's for some people, but that small was too small for me. Um, and also it wasn't what I was passionate about doing. Um, so I said, okay, well, I don't know if I'm going to get a full-time job after I graduate. So I'm going to do this accelerated master's program that our school offered where you got to double dip. And instead of taking regular uh, undergrad classes, you could take them at a higher level and have them count for both. Um, so financially it was awesome. Um, and when I graduated in 2017, I was, I got an internship with Lockheed Martin in the commercial space division. And I thought I could convince them to just hire me. So I wouldn't have to go back to school and finish my master's degree. <laughs> um, but, uh, no, I couldn't even take the internship without going back to school. So I finished my master's degree in one year and I did a autonomous controls machine learning um, using neural networks and um, evolutionary algorithms to control controllers. It was really interesting, worked on my weaknesses as a coder. Um, and my graduate advisor at the time convinced me to go into his program because he showed me a paper he wrote about, um, let's see, a bunch of rovers on Mars that would communicate with each other. Swarm technology is the technical phrase. Um, and so I was like, yes, this is what I want to do. And it was very challenging. <laughs> um, and I eventually got a job offer for Lockheed Martin in the deep space division um, for the OSIRIS-REx mission. Uh, so coming out of 2018, jumped right into that. It, and I joined the team six months before arriving to the asteroid Bennu in the mission operations team as a systems engineer. I got trained up to monitor spacecraft health and safety and write sequences to enable the cool sciences that were the science observations that were done at Bennu. Um, it's actually a picture on my watch <laughs> uh, because we are all obsessed with asteroids. <laughs> um, and I also got real time operator certified. So I always describe that as. Um, if you ever see mission control room movies where someone does the countdown and get all system goes and press the button, that's what I got to do. Uh, it was really scary because you're the last line of defense to the spacecraft, um, but it also was really cool. <laughs> so um, worked there for two and a half years. I actually sent the sequence to touch the asteroid um, and helped review that sequence with my colleague who um, also was female. So it was really cool to be surrounded by a really strong team that had so much female representation. Um, and I also got to help with the development and procedure of the stowing of the sample. So after we touched the asteroid and we looked at it, we noticed that we collected so much sample that it was spewing out of its capsule and we needed to stow it in half the time than we were allocated and a week earlier than we had planned. So it was quite the experience, <laughs> um, but learned a lot. And that team was really great um, working with NASA Goddard and um, our strong team at Lockheed and Kinetics. Um, and after that, it was kind of just because all that happened during the pandemic, it felt like we had to stop everything because all the main part of the mission was done and we were ready to do our return science and come home. So I started looking for other opportunities at Lockheed and got recruited for the Simplex program, which is a NASA endeavor to create, uh, enable more cost-effective science. So it's uh, order of magnitude or more cheaper than an OREX program or Juno or any of the big missions that we normally send out from Lockheed. 
Um, so it's definitely a challenge and I'm working in development in Atlo, which is assembly test launch operations as a software systems engineer and a test engineer. And I, it's definitely been challenging to see this side, but I really like the challenge or seek the challenge <laughs> um, and get part, be part of uh, a new uh, endeavor for our company um, to dip into the small sats, um, but also to allow for schools and other scientists to be able to go out to deep space and the moon at a, a more cost effective point. So I'm learning a lot. I get to touch hardware. I get to look at the code. Um, and I'm still trying to figure out if this is what I want to do or, or touch other things. And luckily work somewhere that that's allowed and you can, they'll work with you to find what you like. And yeah, I'm hoping uh, to hear really awesome answers from the rest of the panel today and see what interesting questions you guys have for us. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Sierra. Casey. Howdy. So I'm a lucky person. Uh, um, I, you know, came from a pretty, you know, average suburban household. It was kind of expected of me to be in engineering. You know, it's my, my track was pretty, pretty straight. Um, but kind of how I got onto it was a little, little, little shaky. So my parents would have described me as a difficult child. Um, so I was not very good at, in high school. Um, I was really infatuated by this TV show called BattleBots. And it like ruined, like nearly ruined my life. <laughs> and so this, this, it was like, it was like this, this crazy thing on TV. And I was just so infatuated with it. And, and that was like the only thing that could motivate me to do anything. So, so I, I got incredibly lucky with a few teachers that kind of pushed me in this direction, um, in, into these like robotics competitions and, and really just like a series of lucky events is how I'm here. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot behind that. So, you know, so I, in high school, I did, you know, battle bots and, uh, went out to one of the TV shows and, and kind of did that throughout my career. Um, and, so I went to school, um, University of Northern Colorado. Uh, I applied to mines, did not get accepted. Um, so, um, so I went to UNC, studied physics. Um, took me like seven and a half years to get there. So, because um, I really wasn't good at it. Um, but what I was really good at was just like kind of solving problems. So I actually, to graduate, I bargained with my professors that I would fix the lab equipment if they would give me my lab cert. Um, it was, and so, so I fixed a, a, a spectrometer for him. So, uh, wrote a bunch of new code for him and did that. So, you know, after that, um, my, my capstone project, um, was a sounding rocket payload. And, um, as I watched that launch, um, that was 20 minutes after Atlantis had touched down. So that was the end of the shuttle program and, um, trying to find a job at that point, you know, I went to kind of a small school, didn't have that great grades. So it was kind of a. It was a rough time. So I um, went for the first job I could get, which was underground uh, blasting in mining. So I actually came up here to School of Mines. Uh, the, uh, have you guys been to the Edgar Mine? So I, I did my MSHA training up there. Um, so, so I was in mining for about a year, got to learn a lot about just how that entire environment worked. Um, and so, you know, that, that was the thing for a while and I really wanted to get out of that. So this lucky opportunity, I, I networked a lot while I was in college and I had some friends at a company called spark fun electronics. And, um, uh, so, um, I just, you know, lucky again, get in the interview, you know, um, just kind of showed, you know, a lot of my battle bot stuff. Half of them were just like, let's hire this guy. Cause like, it's real weird. Um, <laughs> so and like really into this. And so, so I built, you know, electronics for spark fun for a while. And, and so I did that. And then once again, got lucky, um, a company that I had followed through throughout high school was honeybee robotics. Cause I was also really infatuated with the Mars rovers. That was originally what I wanted to do, build Mars rovers. And, um, so I, this, this company that built the rock abrasion tools, it's actually in Longmont, Colorado. Uh, they had moved from New York and they were looking for a test engineer. So I wasn't like trying to be like, you know, lead design or lead anything like that. Um, but I had a little bit of electrical, uh, electrical experience from spark fun. So I was there for about two and a half, three years. And so once again, super lucky, they apparently had just lost a few people. Um, and they just needed somebody. So, so they brought me in 
and I started uh, vacuum chambers. So I built vacuum chambers. Um, so, so started with a bunch of test equipment, um, kind of showed like I knew how to from BattleBots because I did BattleBots a little bit through college and a little bit, little bit at SparkFun. Um, it was an interesting. It's a very time sensitive, cost sensitive because I am paying for all of it, um, and and it has to work. And so I picked up a lot of skills and tricks of like manufacturing, how to like play the sample game with uh, vendors. That was good. Um, and so I, I, I kind of had these skills of just being able to like kind of smash things together. So I would always do these interviews for like engineering positions and like, you know, I'd get the, you know, engineering trivia questions and I didn't know a lot of it. So, but then I would bring out my resume or like, I bring like, you know, the hardware I'd build and it's like, you kind of know what you're doing, but you don't know what you're doing. (laughs) And so, so I kind of have built a career around this kind of being able to take, um, you know, very complex things and break them apart and try to find those solutions. It wasn't until uh, at Honeybee Robotics I learned that there was a whole profession called systems engineering. Um, and so, because I, I went to a small, you know, it was you know, eight people in my physics department. And so I was like, huh, that's a cool name. Um, so I'll try that. Um, so, you know, Honeybee did a lot of great work there. Um, got to go out to JPL, work on um, OCO3, uh, Orbiting Carbon Observatory. Um, so we built some really cool uh, steering, or big, big mirrors for them, um, or the, the actuators. Um, built a lot of CubeSat solar ray drives. That's where I kind of got that kind of scrappy, you know, how do you make something really inexpensive, but really good? Um, and so I had a lot of opportunity to kind of experiment there. Um, and then, um, you know, things things there, I decided to go somewhere else. Um, and I, th- there was two places I interviewed with. One was uh, Blue Origin. Um, and the other one was at the time, uh, Planetary Resources. And, and once again, luck. I, I showed up and um, there's, a, there's a, the person who, one of the founders of that company, uh, Chris Voorhees, was the guy who designed the Mars Rover. He was one of the mechanical engineers. So it's like, I'm like, meet your hero. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, got to meet with him, you know, it was a really great time. And, um, so, you know, he saw my resume and he goes, planetary resources is an asteroid mining company in space. You have been, uh, heavy, you know, uh, a metal mine blaster and an aerospace engineer and an electrical engineer. It's like, how, how did this, how did this happen? And I just went, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, so at the time, you know, we were, we were talking about going out there. Um, and I interviewed at Blue as like my safety school. And so planetary resources didn't work out. Um, the company company ended up folding um, or getting sold. Um, so, so I was like, okay, I'll just go to Blue. And uh, so Blue Origin, once again, I kind of was like, okay, just kind of be a background player. And I got really good at like fixing things. So in test, something would break and it'd be like, okay, well, if we, we kind of switch these things around, we can, we can get back into test. And, and I got really good at just like putting it, I call it firefighting. There are a lot of people call firefighting. And so you get really good at that. And so you end up just like getting stick, you put in more and more weird situations until one day I find myself in West Texas underneath New Shepherd, rewiring the entire aft section of the, of the vehicle to try to try to fix it, fix an issue that I have no idea what I'm doing, but I know enough that like I can make it work. Um, and so, so once uh, New Shepard flew uh, NS15, I decided it was time to come back to Colorado because it's I'm, I'm from, my family's generally from the Colorado area, and I found this great company, Ursa Major Technologies. Um, and when I was at Blue, I really was interested in engines. It just kind of didn't have an opportunity. And once again, got lucky. Um, I, I kind of knew that they that they were looking for an avionics crew, um, but they didn't quite know how to to stand it up. And so I kind of uh, the original interview was, uh, you know, we just need like an avionics technician. And I was like, well, what if I could like help you find a number of people and like set up a set up a group that we could support this internally? And um, and through that, that they decided that uh, we'll, we'll go for it. Um, so that's that's where I'm at right now. So. Um, I still do battle bots occasionally. I haven't done, not this year. They're actually wrapping up filming right now in Las Vegas, but uh, um, it's, it's really funny because it's like one of those things, like if you, if you're into these like robotics competitions and you kind of get them, 
Like it's like a really cool thing to talk about, especially if you work on a bunch of programs that are classified or NDA, <laughs> you know, um, it's really hard to do an interview and be like, here's all of the work I've done in just black slides. Um, so so it, it's always been this kind of like interesting like opportunity and networking that I've that I've leveraged to kind of take this very unconventional path to to be in aeros, you know, being in aerospace. So thanks. Wonderful. Thank you all. So before we go into the next question, which well, I hope we'll really focus on the purpose of what this whole weekend is about, which is to increase diversity and inclusion in aerospace. Before I do that, I've seen a lot of reaches for water and coffee. Would y'all like to take a couple minutes to grab some more water and coffee? I don't mind. I'm asking. I'm good. Don't lie. <laughs> Do you want someone to grab you some water if you have an empty water glass? Y'all are too easy, fine. <laughs> okay, so one of the things that is really important is creating inclusive spaces for people of color and underrepresented groups. We've talked a lot about, even from the beginning and the emails you've gotten on the website when you registered, about the mission of this entire weekend, which to increase the participation and retention of people in underrepresented groups who are interested in aerospace. Some of you in here might be thinking to yourself, that doesn't apply to me, but we made it open to allies as well. And the only thing I ask when we say, well, what does an ally mean? Is that if you don't identify as someone who's an underrepresented group, we just want you to care or at least be interested in solving this problem. And it takes everyone. Because aerospace is so white male dominated, who are the people that are gonna have to change the culture of aerospace to make it more inclusive? White males are people who are not part of underrepresented groups, but it takes everyone else as well. So I hope if you're feeling a little weird, why am I here? We want you here. We need you, we need everybody to make it better. So my question for the panel, before I pass it off to you to ask questions, which I hope you're burning with them by now, is tell us about some experience that you may have encountered yourself where you've experienced maybe a microaggression which, or a macroaggression. <laughs> um, and in your story, tomorrow we'll actually talk more deeply about what microaggressions are and how to address them. But tell us maybe about your experience everyone has experienced a microaggression. It does not have to be just about color or gender. It could be any part of your identity in which you've experienced a microaggression. So keep that in mind. We'll talk about it tomorrow. So if you're comfortable, tell us a story about some kind of microaggression or any space that you felt uncomfortable or, or, or unwelcome. One, to kind of give us a sense of what those look like, how you may have addressed it, maybe how you wish your peers had addressed it, and then perhaps... Um, actually, let's stop there. That's a really long-winded question. So hey, let's start there. Amanda, can you explain for people who don't understand what microaggressions are um, so we can get a feel for what exactly we're dealing with? Sure. I wish I had the definition memorized, but they're, <laughs> they're very often unintentional slights that are based on a stereotype about the person that you've said it to. They are often said with good intentions, but can have harmful impacts. Does that, not, does that help for anyone who maybe didn't know what I meant? Like one of the most common ones. Oh, you're Asian, so you're good at math. It might sound like a good thing, but it's based on a stereotype, right? So microaggression. There are also macroaggressions, which are a lot more egregious and out there. And anybody can unintentionally microaggress someone and you also may have the best intentions and may not realize you do it. Some of us, especially in places of privilege, often do it as well. And so this is a learning space, 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 comfortable space. I know it's a difficult conversation to have, but it's important, especially for the mission of what we're trying to accomplish this weekend. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Amanda, do you want to start? Sure. Cool. Um, sure. So, I mean, 
every day for a long time um, at a variety of different places I've worked. I've had a spectrum of that type of stuff. Um, I can give you a really, really easy and quick example of a microaggression, although it's nowhere near the scope of sort of the more difficult things I had to deal with. Um, so something that happened to me a lot, especially early on in my career um, after college, was that every time, so I worked on small programs, I mostly specialized in rapid space or small space programs for the defense. So that meant I was dealing with the DOD community a lot um, and a variety of different people within that. Um, and it's a space where you can't ask a lot of questions sometimes. There's a lot of things that are sort of, you just need to go with the role and figure things out as it goes. Um, and it's hard when you're the only woman all the time. Um, and so something that would happen a lot is I would, I started taking over one of the projects because there was very few people. And um, so I just sort of, even though it was my first year at the company, I started sort of taking on this role um, that was bigger than what I, what they expected me to do. Um, on the org chart, I had been listed with the only other girl on the project who ended up not being on the project. Um, and it was in the cables field, <laughs> even though I was the mechanical lead <laughs> for the payload. <laughs> so the org chart was this, this thing and I was at the bottom corner and I had nothing to do with cables. Um, <laughs> uh, so I started sort of taking over these, these meetings um, that would happen every week. And after, at the meetings, at the end of the meeting, one of the men in the organization who was oh, so kind, he would come to my office every single meeting and say, all right, Amanda, this is what you did wrong. This is what you did right in the meeting. Um, and he often spoke about how um, I was just, he, I remind him of his daughter and I get this a lot <laughs> still now, even though I'm older. Um, and uh, just the fact that it happened after every meeting I ran and uh, it was just that feeling of you're constantly being so over-evaluated and none of the men on the project were performing particularly well <laughs> or having that level of scrutiny. So every single micro movement I made, every outfit I wore, every single action I did was scrutinized in this level of detail. And then I kind of couldn't talk about it <laughs> to anyone else or anyone around me. And I couldn't um, ask questions um, as, or get things like that org chart formally addressed. I, I ended up being the mechanical lead on that program. I ended up flying across the country to in, integrate my hardware that I led and in, into other things. And I, and I, after that, ended up being the mechanical lead on the International Space Station program. Uh, <laughs> um, so my role obviously wasn't this box of cables, <laughs> but it never got formally addressed, never got changed. So those are like some really small things that just kind of eat at you um, as you um, are in the workplace. And that's also the kind of things that it's a great opportunity for other people you work with to address. If you kind of notice like, hey, this org chart doesn't reflect the actual you know, work of people here. Or if you notice that uh, maybe every single day, don't constantly tell someone you work with exactly what they're doing right and wrong in a meeting. Sometimes you have to let them just work. Um, that, that I think those are some good ways that even if you're not the one experiencing some of these things, you can try to help. Awesome. Thank you. And um, anybody can answer. We can go down the line if everybody has something okay. to say, but yeah. Uh, yeah, let me yeah. just share a little story with you guys. <clears throat> um, so I was born in a small village in the Andes Mountains of Peru, where when I was there, there was no running water, no electricity, no, um, like very little concept of money, no roads. Um, it was pretty, like 100 years behind, <laughs> at least. So, uh, but it was high up in the mountains. My, my hometown is at 10,000 feet above sea level, like Leadville. And um, well, you know what happens when it's that, when you're that high and away from cities at night, you can see the entire Milky Way. It's so clear out there. And that's how I got inspired to build things that go to space. And uh, because I was so isolated from the rest of the world, I thought I was that one person that wanted to build things that went to space. <laughs> I had no idea that, um, the, uh, that, I had no idea about uh, like North America or Europe or nothing, okay? So then, uh, uh, because things got rough in that area, uh, there was um, like um, almost a civil war broke out. Almost it was it got pretty bad. So then we left. We moved to Lima, the capital city of Peru, and um, um, I 
that's when I first got exposed to the rest of the world. I learned about the US, I learned about uh, Europe, and I learned about uh, the Apollo program and realized that there were other people that had already built rockets <laughs> before my time. And uh, uh, so this, so th that was um, uh, while I was uh, adjusting to the, to, the, to the lifestyle in Lima. In, in, in where I was born, my first language um, uh, that I learned at home was uh, Quechua which is the most widely spoken native uh, language in, in this continent of uh, North and South of America. And uh, um, so then when I moved to, to Lima, I, uh, Spanish was my second language and I had a difficult time, um, you know, learning, learning, um, speaking fluently in Spanish. And um, I could see that uh, my, my classmates and uh, uh, even the teachers uh, just uh, it make, it would make fun of me. And um, for me, it was, I didn't feel uh, comfortable sharing with people that I wanted to build rockets because I didn't want to get laughed at. And uh, thankfully, one of my teachers told me, you know, Miguel, you're going to be a great engineer someday. It was my fourth grade math teacher. And um, that, that stuck with me, you know? Uh, so, so I think since then, I chose to listen to the people that, uh, um, that were supportive of me. So, so then, uh, we, uh, because I wanted to build rockets, I, I asked my family to come to the States. I, went, I finished high school here in the States in Anchorage, Alaska. And um, um, I'll tell you that my transition from the village to Lima in Peru was more drastic, was more dramatic than coming from Lima to, to the US. At least um, uh, that they were both, uh, Anchorage and Lima were cities and my time cars and <laughs> airplanes so it's, it's it wasn't it wasn't that big of a change the only change i think it was the language and yeah i, I experienced some you know this, uh, some microaggression from uh, classmates and this is in high school but i think at that point um, i had uh, all, i was already starting to build a thicker skin and i started start, starting to, to to feel more comfortable with um with my um uh, with my aspirations and and that's and then when i went to college um I felt like um, 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 a, a little out of place, but uh, what I found is that um, is that um, um, so so when I, when I was in college, I found I was looking for an organization where I could belong, where I, where I, where I could see people that looked looked like me. In, in, in high school, I wasn't that bad. I, there were some people I wasn't that big of a minority, but in college and in engineering school, I stuck out. So then I found the organization called the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, SHIP, and um, I joined that that group, and um, um, I was able to you know flourish as myself with that organization. And um, whenever I experienced any sort of, um, um, I guess, microaggression, I, it wasn't, um, I, I tried to, you know, especially after having lived, uh, you know, through, through Lima and um, like the, the, the different changes of environment and cultures, um, I think I, I, was, I was already, um, I had already a, a thicker skin than eventually in my career. Um, I thought I could, um, I could handle it. I thought I had uh, gone through uh, all these um, hurdles, uh, but um, uh, I, I kind of um, um, went back actually. Uh, I think I, in, in my career, I reached a point where, <clears throat> where I was already working with the best of the best and um, I had to work harder to, um, uh, I had to work harder than my peers to, uh, to um, to be noticed. Okay, so I, what, what I what I experienced in, in my in my uh, professional career is that um, you know knowing who you know you know uh, having uh, the your network is really important. You need people to vouch for you to to uh, speak on your behalf, especially in your in, in large groups. Um, there's um, your managers. They're they're just people. They're gonna forget who you are. And um, that's the part that uh, that I didn't have. I was a new guy, um, you know, this this brown kid <laughs> who, who still had a thick accent. Uh, so I I, I didn't. Uh, um, I I think uh, I I just I um, brought doubt, I guess. So I had to work extra hard to show people that uh, you know, that I could do it, and um, and and then. A lot of a lot of it was that um, because uh, I really um, 
came from a different world. Um, I wasn't uh, that uh, um, fluent when it, uh, even in, in, in well, like regular uh, language, like um, um, just talking about football and uh, talking about uh, different activities, different uh, everyday things. Uh, I didn't know what they were talking about, so so I found it difficult to to connect with my with my colleagues. You know, I wasn't. I, I wouldn't. I, would, I couldn't. I couldn't. Like, they would talk about baseball, and I'd be like, "I don't know what you're talking about, man." <laughs> so, but I found ways to connect with them, and uh, I, and that's how I was able to to you know go over the, um, to um, to deal with some of those microaggressions that happened in the workplace. And um, uh, I think yeah, that um, over time, I was able to to. Um, to, you know, to make to make uh, progressive movements in my career and uh, uh, build stronger networks in my industry, and uh, now I I have a, I I, um, I can uh, I can run a, a consulting company and uh, find uh, customers that know me that have seen how, how I work, and uh, it uh, really pays to have uh, those. So those allies basically that say, "Hey, look, this guy is—he's he's good. You, you, you can trust him." You know, so so that's what that's what uh, I would say that um, um, the, the world, the professional world, uh, world is not perfect. Uh, in the workplace, you're not going to be 100% safe. It's not a—it's not a nursery. Uh, people will be rough, um, and even if uh, there are uh, regulations, even if there are, you know. Um, uh, requirements to 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 make people behave, you just. Um, I mean, humans are humans, and they're going to um, things are going to happen, and uh, it's up to you to to build your support network. So, thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Who's next? Um, first of all, I I think an interesting uh, observation is as a woman, and you can ask some anybody else but we count the amount of women that are in a room in meetings in classrooms but sometimes me saying that might be a uh a new thought for some other people of oh you actually count and yes we do because we tend to be in the minority of who is in the room um but that doesn't mean you can't be an advocate for those that are in the minority in the room. And I say this to preface this story. I was in a electrical engineering class and I had a professor who I've met on multiple occasions and there's only three women in this class. So I think he would remember who I am. Um, and he called out my name to return a paper and said, who is this? And I raised my hand and he said, oh, you don't look Hispanic based on my last name. And I was just kind of thrown back that he said this in front of the entire class <laughs> or said it at all. And this whiplash just caused me to say, okay. And I wonder how many other people in the room felt the uncomfortable uh, level that I was feeling. <laughs> and it's so easy to sit with these uncomfortable thoughts and not say anything. And I think one of the, re the uh, approach that I'm trying to come at is if you do think that something's inappropriate that was said and no one is saying something, say something. It doesn't have to be, well, that was rude. Um, but it can be something that is, hey, could you say that again to have them reflect on what they just said? Uh, and, you know, we're talking microaggressions, macroaggressions, it's not always obvious, but if you know that it's something that's not really appropriate, say something, even if it's after class or after a meeting, it does help because if you don't, if you continue to allow this behavior to happen, someone who doesn't have thick skin, like yourself, you might get used to some comments, they might not be able to handle it and they'll drop and they won't pursue and it might crush their, their dreams. So think about that. Um, and that's, that's all I want to say. I agree with everything that you said. One of my favorite comebacks, if someone makes like a really inappropriate sexist, racist joke or whatever, is like, I'm sorry, I don't get the joke. Could you explain it? Like, <laughs> I love putting people in that position. Yeah. But rather than have a long-winded story, I thought I'd battle off some microaggressions or larger incidents that have happened. So I had a professor say like, oh, you're Vanessa. I hear you're one of the best students, even though you're a woman. 
when I was in Germany, for some reason, all my classmates spoke to me in English, but they would speak to the American male students in German. I could speak better German than them. That was interesting. When I was hired, it was now my third professional position. Um, I'd been working in the job for maybe two months. And it had there was a great gender split in the group, which isn't normal in Germany in engineering. They're behind the US and really the rest of the Western world in terms of diversity and equity. There was a job interview for a new uh, engineer in, in our department and a woman was leaving our manager's office and one of my male colleagues leaned over to me and said, she's attractive, she's gonna get the job. Found out that my boss was hiring based on how he liked the way women looked. I got out of that role as quickly as I could. Another interesting incident, so after working three propulsion jobs and being hired as a senior propulsion engineer at Lockheed, my new manager comes up to me on my first day at Lockheed says, Vanessa, here's the hardware you're working on, but I'll take it easy. This is how a rocket engine works. And I sat there for 10 minutes stupefied before I could say like, I, you don't need to do this. I'm really sorry. I'm just so astonished that you didn't realize I had this background. And the last incident that comes to mind is pretty recent. So we've raised multiple rounds of venture capital from investors who are generally male and white and from privileged backgrounds. Now that's changing a little bit, but it's still the case. One of the like most shocking reasons why an investor decided not to invest was, he was like, I don't think you can attract and retain talent. And I was like, oh, why? He couldn't answer. I wonder what his thinking was there. But anyway. That was my response. Okay, here's the deal. <laughs> I really wanted to just kind of wait and see what everybody else's experience is. Um, I haven't listened to yours, but I'm really curious, but um, I just want you guys to understand that microaggressions are literally death by a thousand cuts, okay? It's it's that nicking away, you know? It's um, that stereotype that someone has the audacity to say out loud, you know, it's being in that position of privilege and drawing upon something that you have actually no real working idea about, and then placing that on someone else thinking that they're, they're going to live up to that stereotype that you saw on TV or saw in a movie or, you know, something like that. So um, to give you a little bit of background about me, you know, I'm biracial, you know, I'm half black and half Persian, right? So there's some intersectionality there with being a woman. So growing up, you know, on half of my family is in the United States. The other half of my family is in Iran. Okay. So you have to understand that being a millennial and having one side of your family living through Jim Crow, living through real oppression, real racism and sexism, if you're a black woman and the other side of my family who I don't even get to see, but have to, um, kind of gleaned that experience through my father's side, who is an immigrant who left Iran because he protested against the government and he was no longer safe there and coming here and actually growing up and watching him having to deal with racism, with microaggressions. And then all of that combined to have to try to navigate this world. Right. So all that being said, I already feel that you're just kind of brought up in this society with already a chip on your shoulder. You know, you're kind of always playing this. Um, you're always on the defense, you know, and sometimes it's not from white people. Sometimes I get microaggressions from black folks. Sometimes I get microaggressions from Iranian folks because I'm not Iranian enough. Or I'm not black enough you know, and from white people, they usually don't have, a, not a lot of white people have friends that are black or friends that are Persian or one in the same, right? So they come with microaggressions instead of just asking questions, you know, and I'm very open about that. You can ask me anything. I will be very honest with you, but I will not be nice. Okay. So that being said, um, when I started also dealing with 
like overt sexism in academia, in the workspace, that almost was just like a whole different cut in a, in a very different way. For instance, um, I will just say that I worked very hard in college. Like I don't like academia. That's not how I learn. Um, and it was very difficult for me. So one day I went into my professor's office and at, talking to him about my grades. And um, he literally asked me if I was going to school to find a husband and then suggested that I have a baby so that it'll help me give motivation so that I can do better in school. Okay. At that time, I was so taken aback that I actually cried in his office, which didn't make anything better. Um, and I had to let that percolate. And I eventually did report him. And it turned out that he was also making sexist comments on the other women that were in the program. Mind you, it was a very small school. I mean, it, it 20 percent of us weren't even women. It was more like 15. So and he's still there, but he has a record. Um, but at least people are aware. Right. So that is saying something. So ever since then, I kind of, you know, almost go into a situation expecting something sideways to be said to me, which it has, it has. And so because of that experience, I have learned how to defend my, myself and respond in ways that, you know, not having that experience wouldn't have given me. Right. So, um, I've had, uh, you know, there was a technician that I was working with and, um, you know, he's an older gentleman, an older white gentleman. And he just says, you know what? I think you're the blackest person here. <laughs> and I looked him in the eye and I was like, do you ever think about whatever comes out of your mouth, man? <laughs> do you ever think about that? You know? And he just kind of looked at me and walked off and did never say anything to me <laughs> again because I stood up for myself. I've been in meetings where, I mean, stereotypically, I've had a suggestion for a build um, and how to meet schedule. And there's this, you know, this, you know, the nods, right? You think that they're listening to you. And then my male colleague will then say the exact same thing almost that I said. And I'm just like, hmm, that's interesting. I just said that. <laughs> how crazy. And then the acknowledgement comes, right? So, um, and then of course, you know, I've got, I get stupid questions about my hair, you know, I, you know, can I touch your hair? No, you can't touch my hair. I just did it. Okay. You have no idea what kind of work goes into this. You can't just touch it. Um, you know, um, the thing about being a woman, you know, are you married? Do you have kids? Do you want kids? Do you, you know, do you ask men that question? I've literally asked that. Do you ask men that question? I would say for the, for the women, especially, especially the women of color, especially the immigrant women, you have to learn how to defend yourself. You have to learn how to speak up for yourself. And because I've had all of this kind of trauma building through my life, I had to learn how to respond, I guess, with some tact. And that is still something that I'm working on, especially in the corporate space. But um, I've learned that if you can stand up for yourself, if you can advocate for yourself and not only advocate for yourself, if you see something going on with someone else, if you see someone being placed in a position that is being, a, un, that is uncomfortable, sometimes you need to take it upon yourself and step in, whether you have that conversation to the side and said, I don't like the way that he was talking to you. And I've had that conversation with my other female colleagues in meetings where a program manager would literally change his tone talking to a male colleague and then talking to a female colleague who has just as much experiences, but doing that inflection, you know, that voice where it's like, you have this man voice, I'm talking to you like a person. And then, you know, you shift into, are you sure you can do that? Do you need any help? You know, those are microaggressions. You know, those are things that, that I, that I, I'm hyper aware of, 
So for me, you know, I tell my, my female identifying, um, colleagues that, you know, this is what I've noticed. Did you notice it too? Yes. You're, you don't feel comfortable, you know, speaking out. I will speak out, you know, I will say something because I don't appreciate that. I'm not going to sit here and let someone talk to you like that. When you are a capable person, when you've proven yourself as a capable engineer, I'm not doing that. You know, this is 2021. We're still doing this. We're really still doing this. So um, sometimes you have to have those, those difficult conversations. Sometimes you have to be the bad guy. And that's just what it is. If you don't start calling out people on their behavior, it's never going to change. And I'm guilty of this too. You know, I was an ableist, you know, I'm an ableist because I didn't know anyone that was disabled. I didn't have anyone disabled in my family. I didn't um, have disabled friends. But once I started being called out on my views, I'm able to step back and realize, hey, what I'm doing is not right. Where am I? Where is this even coming from? You know, and I've had to adjust my actions and my words to be more empathetic to people who are different than me, you know? So um, we need to go into that space with being mindful that people come from different backgrounds, that, you know, people have different experiences. They learn differently than you. And um, sorry, there is a fly. Yeah, I just love <laughs> but I mean, and we need allies. We, uh, we need everyone to do this because if, <laughs> you know, it has to change, you know, Part of my job is making sure that my team is cohesive so we can execute in our programs. If we are not cohesive as a team, we are not going to make schedule. We are going to lose money, you know, and that is applied into our personal lives. So um, we can all do better. We can all do better. Learn how to take that constructive criticism and do better. Be the change that you want to see. That's exactly. I, so... I'm guilty of it. So, you know, early, you know, I, I grew up in a suburb, you know, very, you know, heteronormative family. And, you know, and when you, when you kind of grow up in that, like kind of small town, you, you just develop these things and you don't even know it. And, and I think the biggest, the biggest lesson I've learned, like, I would say like the last, you know, five, five, six years is like what microaggressions can be and like how tiny they can be. And like even just calling out somebody even good and then associating it, how they identify, like these two things are great. You're great. Like that's one. Um, and, and the biggest thing, once again, I'm lucky, I'm privileged. I'm so privileged that people feel like they can tell me that I made a microaggression. And that's like, that's its own level of privilege. Um, and so the biggest thing, the biggest takeaway is like, if somebody comes up to you and says like, that was wrong, you said that and you need to change. Like I've, I've seen this in engineering. I've seen this in, I've seen this in many, many organizations. Like there's two ways you can do this. You can either internalize it, figure out what you did, make a change, or you can start to resent that person. And then it just becomes, it just becomes worse. And so if somebody, you know, somebody comes up to you, like they've, they've had to like one overcome what you said to them. And then they have to tell you and risk that like even more retaliation, especially in a, in a corporate setting that, you know, you at this, you know, it's, it becomes like, you really like have to think about it and think about what happened and why, why this happened. And so, you know, it's accept that criticism, um, you know, learn from it, you know, you know, apologize. <laughs> That's always a good start. Um, but, but really internalize. And then if you see somebody like that, it, that is a big thing that I've, I've noticed. Like once, once my eyes are kind of open to it, like you, you start to see more of it. And, you know, like I've, I've, recently even, um, it was in an interview panel and we had this phenomenal, phenomenal candidate and, you know, the industry I'm in, it's, it's, it's a lot of white males and, um, uh, we had a woman on our team that, that was on the interview panel and, um, and we had our, our get together afterwards to kind of talk about the candidate and all of us were just like, yep, great candidate. Let's hire this person. You know, this, 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 this is in the bag. And, and she, you know, 
spoke up and said, you know, this candidate was very condescending to me and, and wouldn't, wouldn't respect us. And it was one of those things where it's like, like you realize like people, because of who I am and what I am, you know, people put on a face for me that they won't put on for other people. And, and like, listen, like you listen to that. Like if, if you can listen, if somebody is willing to say something, please just listen to it. And as soon as we, as you know, as soon as we heard about this, we were like, you know, she's a very valued member of our team. And, and like, why would we want to bring somebody into our team that may mesh with everybody, but not that person? It's like, you're bringing in one and you're pushing one out. And, and it, you know, if you want to just take a cold calculate, it's like, you're, you're, you're not going to be plus an engineer. You're just going to be, you know, at where you started. And then likely you're going to create, start fostering a culture that doesn't allow that to grow. So um, that's probably the biggest takeaway I've, I've taken, you know, in the last couple of years and, and every day is like a new learning event. So, you know, you learn every day, you know, take, take the criticism, internalize it, you know, do your best, but also like, you know, try to think ahead a little bit. So see what, see what, you know, yeah. Wonderful, thank you all. It was a really amazing dialogue. And I know it touched on a lot of really difficult topics to talk about. How's everyone feeling? Feeling weird? Feeling good? Let's have, let's stand up. Let's stand up and shake it out. Let's, let's stand up and shake it out a little bit. You can do it. You can do it. Is your leg asleep? I understand. Yeah. Get a little, little stretch. There you go. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for doing that with me. Yeah, in the back, ah, I see it. Yes, okay, have a seat. It is 6.20. We are here until seven, but if you have to go, I understand. But now we had two questions answered from me, but that was all really good information. So now I wanna pass it off to you all to ask questions about engineering specifically, day-to-day, -day, advice, whatever. I will throw a stress ball to you if you ask questions, but I hope that you're like bursting with questions anyway and I don't have to, you know, what's the word? Bribe you? <laughs> Bribe you with stress balls? Yes, okay. Let me grab my stress balls and who's got a question? Back there, we got a microphone coming to you right now. All right. Um, so, uh, I like, I like to be focused on like the space aspect of kind of engineering. And so one thing that I've noticed in the space industry is a lot of it's motivated by competition, whether you look at, um, like United States versus Soviet union, um, for the space race, or you look at other companies, do you guys think that, um, competition is All right, I'll take this one. So as a small and yet rapidly growing company, we've made a really big focus on hiring a diverse workforce. Now we do have shortcomings. Some reasons for that are we don't, we can't offer paid parental leave. So we just don't have the cash on hand. Next month, we're starting for the first time health insurance for our employees. You're right, including employees with families and kids. Like um, for the first three years of the company, you know, we really wanted to offer these things, but to execute, to be competitive, we couldn't. So we actually excluded ourselves from some really great candidates because we're focused on saving money. But now that we do have more cash on hand, like we understand that we need a more diverse workforce. We really need to support families, minorities, sponsor events like this to get to where we want to be. So it's really a double-edged sword. To be the company we want to be, we know that we need a diverse workforce. But in the early stages of being a company, like we just couldn't do what we wanted to do because we didn't have the resources. And there are companies out there that are 40 white dudes, like former SpaceX. And like I called them out on that. And they're like, oh, we don't have cash to like go out and recruit great women or people of color or offer benefits. Like there are companies completely ignoring this. And I'm 
hoping that they learn the error of their ways or crash and burn. So, you know, it ultimately like increasing diversity is going to help us be a better performing company, but it was like something that we couldn't even consider because of the hot competition in our early days when we had less money. I'd like to add to, to what Vanessa said. By the way, great answer there. You know, when you look at the, the diversity at, at, a, at a world scale or just at a national scale, um, let's see, I think India could be a really good example. They, they, they were trying to figure out how they could to get ahead of China. And, um, and then they realized that um, half their workforce was unskilled. That's because they were women. And uh, that, um, if you now go back, come back to the U.S., and um, you know, here we are thinking, oh yeah, we, we don't have um, we, you know, candidates. We don't we don't have qualified people. Uh, we don't have people um, that we need. And then uh, when you really look at what's happening here in the U.S., it's uh, it's pretty um, frustrating because um, there are so many, so many, so many, so many bright women and people of color that. Um, um, they, they had they just didn't have the resources or the awareness to um, pursue a career in engineering or any sort of defense related stuff you know so um like like in, in my case for example um when i i had to um like growing up um i, I was i was weird I was, I, my my <laughs> my uh my idols were not like Superman and Batman. My idols were Hispanic astronauts, <laughs> like uh, Franklin Chan Diaz and uh, um, Elena Ochoa and um, uh, um, uh, Jose Hernandez. By the way, Jose Hernandez was on my board on, on the board of one of my companies, which was uh, amazing. Talk about uh, what is it? The uh, when you see your your hero, you know, yeah. So. <laughs> anyway, uh, where I'm going with this is that um, when you when you don't when, when as a company or as a country when you overlook at your population and just try to keep the opportunities open for the select few, you are preparing yourself for failure. Because there are other companies, there are other countries out there that are that are that are, that are going to uh, that have much bigger teams, much much um, even if uh, they maybe they um, not going to into detail. Um, there are other companies that are going to use their utilize their workforce, their 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 human resources much better and in, in the world and in, in the company. The most valuable resource is the the people without the people you, you don't you don't have a company so and it's same with the country when you, when you don't have the population you don't have the the the, the, the brain power to to stay ahead of the competition um fail eventually so 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 yes to so diversity is uh, i mean um being, being able to provide the access to 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 the, to the population to to be um, the best that they can be, that that should be priority even in, in, in a company. Um, so I just wanted to add something. Um, so those those are really good points, and that's I think the main points to make. Um, but I do want to add. Um, play devil's advocate a little bit and talk about how competition has also been somewhat of a good thing in aerospace recently, especially lately for our community. Um, when I started in aerospace back in like the early 2010s, um, the, it was much more stagnant, the industry. Um, and a lot of this competition has really revitalized uh, the, uh, the um, aerospace community specifically and opened up a lot of new opportunities. Um, so for instance, it used to be the only people that could be the PI, which means the principal investigator of a spacecraft. Um, so that's sort of the person in charge of the science mission, getting the money from the U.S. government um, in America specifically. Um, it used to be that those people were a few academics at a few really fancy institutions. That was almost the only way you could get like a big satellite launched um, 
for studying the science side of things. And, um, you know, um, because we've opened up a lot more competition, there's a lot more launch opportunities. And now there's all these um, small uh, startups kind of like Planetary Resources and some of these other places um, that are um, approaching some of these same goals from a different angle, it's really um, increased other people's opportunity to get involved. Um, and with my personal career, I've just seen that explode um, from, you know, comparing what it was like in the early 2010s to what it's like now, it feels like you can do so much more. Um, so um, it, maybe it's not the best way to go about it. Um, I think there's a lot about the America, um, the climate of how uh, competition works in a lot of different industries in America that maybe not be ideal. And we do need to keep an eye on diversity and make sure that even though we're trying to be lean and compete, we, we include these diverse teams. Um, it can also be a positive thing that we did bring these new people into the workforce because of the money that flew in from like venture capitalists and some billionaires. So. Thank you. Who asked that question? Who gets the ball? Ooh, up too far. I forgot. I, I used to play softball. I forgot. <laughs> All right. All right. Where are the hands again? Yes. You got a microphone coming right behind you. Beautiful white hoodie. I'll learn your names by Sunday. So um, one thing that you guys mentioned was that microaggressions are death by a thousand cuts, basically. And I was thinking about how, you know, whenever I experience a microaggression, it really sticks with me for a long time. And I always wonder why that is, because I know that about like most of the time, people aren't trying to be mean. They're not trying to hurt your feelings. They're trying to like even say something like to get to know you more or something like that. And so I'm wondering, I guess, why does it stick with me so much? Like, why do I reflect on it for like weeks later? Why do you think it's such a big deal? I guess. I'll go ahead and answer that. Um, well, let me ask you this. Do you, when that happens, did you, do you eventually confront the person that, you know, the source of the microaggression? No, I'm very conflict Yeah, so that's why. <laughs> you know, um, especially sometimes, you know, they, I forgot what the actual scientific term is, but, you know, when a wrong is committed against you, no matter how severe, you're kind of in a state of shock right? You, you can't believe that thing just happened to you. You can't believe that what was said that hurt you so deeply just happened. And so sometimes you have to kind of rectify within yourself, like, did this just happen? And then you kind of go through these motions of like gaslighting yourself, you know, maybe that's not what I heard, but then you let it percolate a little bit more. And you're like, no, that is what I heard. That's what it, that's what they said. And, you know, you're right. Sometimes people unintentionally use microaggressions to try and relate to you somehow. And it used to be cool. It ain't cool anymore. So you got to start calling that out and you don't have to be mean. You know, I actually had a friend, um, this white girl <laughs> that I went to school with that I'm still very, very good friends with. Okay. Um, she, used to refer to her hair as Negro hair. Yes. And, you know, she doesn't have a lot of black friends. So she thought, you know, she's cool like that. And I said, listen, you cannot refer to your hair as Negro hair. It is offensive. And also it's not true. So I would appreciate you if you didn't do that anymore. Thanks. And she, she never did. She actually apologized. And she never did that. And actually, and our relationship is stronger. We have a better line of communication because I checked her and I did it in a very nice, you know, kind way because I, I know that she's coming, <laughs> she's coming from a good place. She's my friend. But again, if no one ever calls you out on the things that you say, if you never call someone out, you know, on the things that they say that actually hurt you. And if they don't listen to you, then you you have to learn early on that sometimes those people are not meant to be in your life. They could be people, they can be your job, they could be your family. You know, you have to you have to start taking the steps to um, 
to, to stand up for yourself. And it start. and I mean, it's, it's literally, it's a process. You can start just, it's just literally one foot after the other, but if you don't, it literally, it rots you from the inside out. And then you start projecting, you know, your insecurities and you start projecting your anger on people that honestly don't deserve it. So, I mean, that's my experience. I mean, I would like you guys to share your experiences. I personally need to address more of this in my life. <laughs> my story of, about my school experience, I did make a report, but I always wondered what would happen if I went into that professor's office and confronted him about it and if it would have made me feel better about the situation. Um, and sometimes you'll gain more confidence as you <laughs> go through your career um, and your life in general. Um, and I'm working on something, an, a coworker right now that just, I don't feel heard around and I don't know where that's coming from. And it's on my list for next week to discuss <laughs> a, path, a path forward. <laughs> so um, these environments and uh, being able to talk with awesome panelists and, and hear your guys' questions is what should propel you to put you out of your, uh, your comfort zone and push yourself to be better. I would also like to add that you have to understand for women, we're acculturated, you know, to make ourselves small, you know, to um, accommodate everyone else, to think about everyone else's needs, you know, sometimes being selfish is okay. You know, there's a spectrum for everything, right? I'm very kind of Aristotelian in that. I don't believe in being on two ends of the extreme. You've got to meet somewhere in the middle. So, um, you know, we have to start, you know, teaching our girls, you know, and teaching women to learn how to stand up for themselves, you know, and men, you know, men of everyone, when they see something or hear something that, you know, inherently is wrong, even if it comes from a good place, you know, it's wrong. You know, there's something wrong that was said, something that, you know, just didn't rub you the right way. You need to start stepping in and being like, Hey, Hey, brah, that's not cool, brah. I don't know how guys talk to each other. That's what I'm assuming. Hey, Chad, that wasn't awesome. You know, Chad, you can do better. Like, bro, like, <laughs> you know, not cool, dude. So, <laughs> I mean, those are my stereotypes. I'm working through them, but, um, yeah, you really, I mean, it will, it will, it, it does. It's just festers. Now, depending on what your situation is, it may not make you feel better right then and there, but slowly, but surely you'll have that weight just lifted off of you because you stood up for yourself. And that is something to be celebrated in and of itself. Find your hype crew that will yeah. push you <laughs> to do the thing that you need to do because yeah. you, they might not be able to. Yes. Queen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Surround yourself with that support system that will push you to confront or ask for what you deserve and those kind of things to add. Yeah. I think at the end of the day, it comes down to power, you know, when you're a minority entering a new space that uh, you're the minority, <laughs> you just, the, 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 in airspace, the white men have the power and have had it for so long that those, each cut is a way for them to maintain their power and keep you down. And that's why it's so important. All of this is so important and valuable to learn how to do that. Um, I was like you and I'm very conflict averse and I didn't learn how to speak up for myself. Um, before I left college, I actually took an acting class and this awesome woman, um, Eliza Van Court, she's so cool. Um, she taught this acting class and she did a bunch of sessions with me where we would reenact those little microaggressions. And she'd teach me how to use some techniques to take some power back. And um, that was incredibly helpful. And also reading up on this a little bit. So if you are like naturally very conflict diverse, you didn't, I didn't have any need to learn this until I entered the engineering workspace in, in my life. Like I, I grew up with all women. <laughs> it didn't even occur to me to have this problem until I w w encountered it professionally. And it, it's, you have to address it and you have to take that power back. That's a really good question. You're, that's a really great question that um, it, it's actually, it's something that I think industry needs to learn 
because you know what's 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 really common in um probably in many professions is that um there may be somebody in the, in a in a team or a or in a company that's very toxic okay but because that person is so sharp or because that person has um whatever uh, <clears throat> um power over the team or whatever because because it, because that person uh, um, brings i guess at the, at the end of the day uh, adds value to the company money wise uh, they um they get to get away with uh, their behavior uh, most of the time it's men sometimes it could be women and it, it could also be people of color uh, it's it sometimes it comes down to personality and um uh, I, man, I, I can't, I'm so shocked to see that uh, even in some of the best companies that are, that, that are out there, there are still people that have these, uh, the, these, uh, these privileges, you know, uh, uh, people will be like, Hey, uh, no, we have to deal with him because he's very valuable. We have, we have, we can't talk to him. We have to let it be. That's just how he is. You know, that's how, that's just how she is. And the, and the thing is that, um, You'd be surprised. So many people are so um, conflict averse. They 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 would rather just go into work, put in their hours, and go home and put that aside, and you know, and, um, have a life outside of work. You know that works for some people, but like for me, it doesn't. Uh, I um I I I, um, I learned especially because of my background. I I've I've become more um, uh, more attuned to what's going on around. And um, because of how I, how the, all the, all the, sorry, the crap that I dealt with in, my, in early, earlier in my career, I, as a business leader, I make it a, 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 my job to to watch out for that stuff, to not let anybody have have some sort of um, you know power over others. I, I, I try, I try to make sure that uh, that we we all, we're all very transparent. My team is right there; they can tell you. <laughs> There you go. <clears throat> By the way, we're hiring interns. <laughs> so, <laughs> electrical. <clears throat> so, so anyway, the, th the thing is, um, they, they're right. They're right. They, they, we 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 need we do need to speak up. And first of all, look, I want to thank you guys for being here. This this is a weird, awkward conversation that we're having, but but in, but it needs to be had, right? It needs this needs to happen. It needs to happen. And uh, companies should have these conversations. You'd be surprised how many companies. Do not have these conversations, and people. When when these conversations come around, people are like, "Oh, great! <clears throat> I mean, I'm gonna sleep through this," you know. <clears throat> so, so that's that's still going on, and uh, and and um, I'm, thank you for being here. Thank you for asking these questions because th these things are still you know getting worked out. And uh, what what really helps is for people to speak up to, to you know to bring it up. Uh, don't um. If you if you don't feel comfortable bringing up to that person, you can bring it up to a friend. Perhaps a friend could be an ally who could, could speak up for you. Uh, or or if you or if you see something happening, uh, like one time uh, I had a um, I, I have to share this. I think this is sorry I'm going over time here. Uh, a colleague of mine, very sharp guy. Um, he, uh, he he was uh, he was Canadian, um, and uh, I mean he's he is of uh, 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 different different country let's say and um and he was uh, he's jewish and he also had um i would say a little bit of asperger's okay and because of that the uh, the engineers just picked on him and then the technicians were even worse and he, he had no idea he just thought they were being <clears throat> they were being friends uh, and i could see it happening and it, uh, after a while i just you know when it, when it, when it came time for my annual review i had to say something I, I said something, I brought it up to HR, and yeah, that, at that point, it's uh, you know it's off my hands. But the thing is, uh, it, it was it was it was bothering me, and and it's because uh, again, going back to my experience, my life experiences, I I I, I saw I, I felt how how some of these things, some of these little comments could be uh, could be uh, um, detrimental to somebody, and I didn't want this person to struggle through that. So uh, anyway, I, 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 in, in my team, I, I do make, make it clear that uh, we are pretty transparent and anything that, that, uh, um, that, we're not, that nobody has any privileges, uh, um, you know, in, um, because if they're toxic, they're out.
Thank you. Who else had questions? Okay. What I'm going to challenge us to do, you're going to get a ball because you had a question, but I would like for us to kind of transition over to networking.